Since 2015, Pop Health Podcast has brought to you some of the best minds in healthcare, including leaders from government, not-for-profit, and investor-backed powerhouses, as they share successes, failures, and how our audience can move forward in today's constantly evolving healthcare world. Thank you for joining us for today's episode presented by 24-Hour Home Care. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Pop Health Podcast. I'm Gavin Ward, host of Pop Health Podcast. In today's episode, I had the opportunity to sit down with Rebecca Boyd Anderson, the Director of Population Health for Partnership Health Plan of California. In today's episode, we learn how Rebecca started in healthcare, not actually as a clinician, but more on the business side, but then later decided, hey, I think I want to be a nurse. And she'll walk through that story and share how she ultimately made it to Partnership Health Plan of California. And she actually had the opportunity to start the Population Health Department. In today's episode, Rebecca shares a little bit about how her experience in workers' compensation helped her to really understand whole person care and inspire her to lead this new department that serves many counties in rural California. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Feel free to check out other episodes of Pop Health Podcast by visiting us at pophealthpodcast.com, checking us out on our YouTube channel, listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your shows. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy today's episode. Hello, Rebecca. Thanks so much for joining the show today. Thanks so much for having me, Gavin. Absolutely. So um, you may know this, Rebecca, but we typically like to kick off our shows before we get into the core expertise of the guest and their organization. We get to know the guest uh, and their hobbies, fun facts, background, things like that. So let's start with you and uh, let's start on a question of a fun fact hobby, something outside of the workplace. Absolutely. About five years ago, my husband and I had a chance to take a dream trip to New Zealand. And one of the Airbnbs we stayed in was owned by a woman who's an artist. She, her home was filled with her own art. And I thought, oh man, I want to do that when I grow up. I'll give myself 20 years because I have zero artistic talent. So I came home and enrolled in a, an adult ed class. And within six months, I produced something I was not embarrassed to hang on the wall. <laughs> and I've been doing art painting um, ever since. I work in pastels and oils. And since COVID, I work in colored pencils. Wow. That is awesome. You mentioned you had no artistic talent. I still do not have artistic talent. But the fact that you're able to whip something up in six months is uh, is pretty cool. I have a, a young daughter who's really into art right now. So um, that definitely hits home with me. So let's get to know you a little bit more. So mm -hmm. uh, besides art, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, where you where you grew up. But tell us a little bit about your background and your schooling and ultimately what inspired you to get into healthcare. Oh, that's a lot of questions. Um, so I grew up, um, I was born in the Burbank area, okay. and then we moved to New Jersey for four years when when I was still pretty young. And then we landed in the East Bay of the San Francisco Bay Area, which is what I call home. Um, my parents worked really hard to give us a really safe and sheltered childhood, made sure we had all of the food, clothes, doctor's appointments, and everything that we need. And you know, I didn't fully appreciate it until working in this role where it's like, oh my goodness, I was so privileged beyond belief. Um, one of the things I did do during that time, though, um, as an adult was spend four years in Canada, which has a very different healthcare delivery system. And so I've had, I've had that uh, public healthcare, single payer healthcare experience as well as the U.S. experience. Yeah, that's great. I think we only, I think that's very unique. Um, and I think some of the audience may be familiar with the Canadian system, which I believe it's universal health care. Yes, there. it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned you're in the East Bay. I think the only other person that I know who, who may have had at least somewhat similar experience was um, the, not sure if you knew this because you're you're in Northern California. But uh, the Stanford director of case management a, a few years back had a similar experience. Her name was Karen Nelson. Mm -hmm. So um, so audience, if you want to hear a little bit about Canadian healthcare, that episode uh, with Stanford actually does go into that surprisingly a little bit. So you're in the East Bay. Um, you're still in Northern mm -hmm. California. At mm -hmm. what point as you're growing up and, and living in Northern California now, uh, where what was the inspiration to get into healthcare? It's that's an interesting question. As a as a little girl, all I wanted to do was get married and have babies. And um, my teachers would say, you know, you could do other things as well. I'm like, nope, that's my path. But after I had kids, I 
found that I wanted and needed to work. And so I applied for um, a temp agency and they landed me at an organization called Paradigm. Paradigm is based in the East Bay and it is, it, this was 25 years ago, they were doing something very unique, which was um, catastrophic case management for workers' comp patients. When I joined Paradigm, they had about 2,000 cases. And in my role as a document processor, I read every single file. Oh, wow. And I learned so, so much about what it takes to take somebody whose life has had a catastrophic injury and how do you build somebody's life back again? And I saw what worked and I saw what didn't work. Um, It was pretty exciting. Yeah. Wow. So go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So what was interesting was from there, they decided to branch out into high risk neonatal management and in the group health insurance place. I was moved to working with the senior director of product development. And our job was to figure out how to prospectively price a book of business to cover high-risk neonates. Mm -hmm. Um, So I proposed a methodology where I said, you know, um, I think we can apply APR DRG groupers to babies within five days of birth using um, this, this proposed methodology that I suggested. And he said, show me. And we did. It was it was a really exciting time. We we built this product with epidemiologists and neonatologists and statisticians, and um, it was such a successful product that it was sold and moved to Tennessee. And I did not move to Tennessee, <laughs> and I was like. But wait, this was my favorite job in the world. I loved everything about it, and I wasn't clinical. Uh, so I thought I got to I got to do something about this. And the shortest distance between two points was to get an RN license. And the quickest way to get accepted into nursing school at that time was to apply for a master's in nursing. And so I did. And Oh wow. Yes. <laughs> so I joined UCSF. Um, they have a, a master's entry program for nursing. Excellent, excellent program where you get your RN licensure in one year and then you proceed directly into your master's studies. Wow. Um, yeah. The only thing was once I got my RN license, I'm like, but I love everything. I don't want to focus on one master's area of focus. <laughs> so I took some years out and practiced nursing and did some med surge nursing and some acute rehab nursing. And then I went back to contract actually with Paradigm as a workers' comp case manager. Oh, okay. Awesome. I, um, I've i worked in workers' comp myself a little bit on the home care side um, on my day job. So I, I'm by no means an expert like you are, but I know a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. a little bit about it. So you went back to Paradigm, you, mm-hmm. you've done, you went back to work comp, you studied nursing. Tell us how you ultimately ended up at a public health plan, basically, or a, a, at a, a managed Medi-Cal plan, I should say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I was working as a work comp case manager and kind of exploring what other career options there were. And I kept realizing that I really did need to finish my master's degree to be able to move into some of the work I was interested in. Um, But the program that really resonated most with me actually was at Samuel Merritt University, where they offer a master's of um, nursing and case management. And so I went there, got my master's, and was immediately recruited into hospital based case management, which is really about discharge planning. Yes. It was fascinating, invigorating, exhausting. I called every Friday afternoon from four to five, I called it happy hour because we <laughs> were just insane trying to get all the members, all the patients discharged before the weekend, set up good discharge plans. But but I also kept thinking about, is this where I see myself long-term? And so during that, I went to a workers' comp, um, sorry, a case management conference, and there was a speaker, uh, Dr. Kavita Patel, who served in the Obama administration and was really a key player in developing the Affordable Care Act. And she presented a challenge at this group. She does not know me. I keep trying to friend her on LinkedIn, but she's like, who are you? Um, But she challenged the audience. She said, you know, if the brightest and best don't serve the underserved, what hope do they have? 
And I really thought about that. It's like, yeah, our heart is patients. Anybody who has commercial insurance, I'm not worried about their discharge plan. Yes, it might have some hiccups, but they're resourced. It's these people who don't have these resources that that are really a problem. Um, and so while I was ruminating over that, I got a call from a recruiter who invited me to apply to be director of case management at um, Partnership. I took the interview thinking, I don't know. And I went, interviewed, and never looked back. I was like, I love these people. I love their mission. And the job, the mission, my team, the patients, they've changed my life. I mean, it's wow. just been incredible. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty big statement. Wow. Okay. Awesome. So, um, you, case management. Now we're let's let's shift into population health, which is a phrase that has been around for a while, but I think it's really picking up steam. Um, Want to get to know partnership as well, but could you maybe first start off with maybe defining population health for our audience? Who many of us we've heard it, but how do we simply define it? Yeah. Um, so. I want to I want to talk about the way I do case management because it really informs how I think about population health. Um, one of the things that that I discovered as a case manager in work comp world, I had my very first case. The man had an above knee amputation and a pelvic crest injury, and he got injured in October, and in January he was home from rehab, and his wife mentioned, you know, he can't get out of bed. His bed is too soft. It's um, So when, when he's trying to get out of bed, he's flopping and squirming and working his way to the edge of the bed, and I remember thinking, oh, that ain't safe. Yeah. And in workers' comp, if somebody dies as a result of their work comp injury, then the work comp case is, is responsible. And so they have to pay out the all that, those claims. Yeah. And so I, when I looked at that, I said, it's not safe for you to be in that bed. And I went to the adjuster and said, can I buy this man a new bed? Because if there's a fire in their home, he's got to be able to get out and he's not able to. So I was able to buy them a bed for Valentine's Day. And okay. I, was, I was quite happy about this, but... But it was an early experience on in lieu of services because there's no way where you can show evidence-based treatment that requires a bed for somebody with an amputation. Yeah, that, that how rare is that? Yeah, I mean, That doesn't go together. And so when you fast forward to what is population health, population health is trying to look outside of the box. It's trying to say, what are the conditions that contribute to this person's health and well-being? And so, um, when I when you ask that, a lot of providers have heard of population health as a reimbursement strategy. It's like value-based purchasing for a book of business or um, for primary care. Public health tries to think about it as things like uh, improving a water supply or um, the health of an overall population in their community. But DHCS actually just last week released a roadmap and strategy that they describe population health as a process to identify, measure, and develop solutions that address outcome differences by race, ethnicity, language, and other factors to advance health equity. So if you think about it, if you think about it, you, Gavin, from yeah. your own healthcare perspective, um, think about the things that you do to keep yourself healthy. Do you go to the gym? I work out, but not at, at home. I do. Yes. Okay. But you're able to work out at home. Do you have equipment at home? I do. Okay. Um, do you get to choose a specific diet? Do you try to eat healthy, organic, vegan? Uh, I should, but I <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> um, if you wanted to, could you? Yes. Yep. Can, do you get your teeth cleaned regularly? I do. Have your teeth been straightened or whitened? Uh, yes. So what allows you to do those things? Um, physical capability and financial capability. Yeah. You have a job. You have benefits. You know that you where to go to get those resources. And what DHCS is saying with their CalAIM population health 
perspective is we need to make sure that all of our members, all of the Medi-Cal population has the ability to make those same choices you do. They may not make them the same way, but how can they say, I want to work out? Yeah. How can they say, I want to eat something that doesn't come from a convenience store yeah. or a fast food chain? And so that's really what population health is all about. Wow. Awesome. That's a pretty, uh, I love, I love the questioning. I, I'm so used to asking the questions, but you did a great way defining it by helping me see it in those, in those ways. So, um, now, l let me backtrack a little bit to partnership. I kind of jumped ahead to what I was planning to ask. So you're with partnership. You've been there a long time. A lot of our audience uh, is Californians, but many are actually in Southern California as well. And they may not have heard of partnership before. So can you give an overview of who and what partnership is, Partnership Health Plan? Absolutely. Partnership is a community or, or a county organized health system or COS plan that is voted in by county supervisors and we are responsible for providing Medi-Cal services to the uh, safety net population, the underserved population. We are in 14 counties in Northern California and 10 additional Northern California counties have been given permission to join us. Um, in 2024. So it's um, possible we'll be in 24 Northern California counties by 2024. Wow. Yeah. That, that would be one of the largest county plans if you're counting by counties, right? In the, in the mm -hmm. state. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. And when you say, if you might, uh, forgive me for going in the weeds a little bit, but you mentioned the other 10 counties that you might add um, they mm -hmm. might you what's the situation there is that normal for counties to be able to choose another plan if they want it or, or um there's a bidding system that i believe happens every 10 years and they're able to say again it's a county voted in process and so they've had other health plans in their counties over the last decade and now that they're coming up for re-procurement they're saying we would like to choose a different opportunity and so they are of um they've gone to the state and have been given what's called conditional approval to join partnership. So we're still in the dating stage. Um, we're going steady. <laughs> but um, there's still some things that we're working to put into place. Okay, awesome, cool. So you've been with partnership, uh, how long, if you mind me asking? Six years. Okay, awesome. And was the Population Health Department in existence when you came in or? No, what happened, I was hired on as Director of Care Coordination, yep. and we, shortly after I hired on, we decided to pursue NCQA accreditation, and NCQA introduced um, the population health uh, standards, and so we were one of the first plans to be accredited under the Pop Health standards, um, and it was my job to figure out what do they mean and how do we prove that we're doing it. So after doing that for a few years, I said, you know, it's a little much to try to do care coordination and this whole new program. So the organization um, actually had to appeal to the state and, and introduce the idea of adding another department and another director to our, our team. But I, I started this two years ago. Oh, awesome. So you're making history, right? In a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, and I know um, in our in future episodes, we're going to explore uh, uh, with other guests the 2023 plan and the launch of California's, uh, I don't know how to phrase it, a public health initiative, or, or what would you call the 2023? So CalAIM has, been, has started this year with community supports and enhanced care management, but in 2023, they're moving forward with their population health management strategy. So... Thank you for thank you for clarifying. Um, I think I know a lot until I talk with folks like you, and you help uh, you help clarify for me. So we've done a series on Cal Aim um, and enhanced care management and community supports, and I know you're focused on other things. But would you mind sharing with our audience, uh, with partnership, and um, you know, at a, at a high level, how is Cal Aim changing what's happening at partnership? Again, we can keep it high level. Um. Well, in a lot of ways, Cal Aim is refining what we've already been doing with NCQA. Okay. And so uh, DHCS 
started thinking about population health, well, they started thinking about CalAIM, I would say about five years ago. They went around and interviewed all of the health plans and said, what is working in care coordination and what's not working? And they've got some really great feedback from, from the whole state. And, and based on that, they said, you know, we, we assess our members a bazillion times, but the, we don't share that information with each other. No. And we have too many case managers. Um, every, anybody who needs a case manager probably has five of them and they all have their own care plan and no. they all have a way of approaching problem solving, but nobody can get out of the walls of healthcare. Like you can't, you can't pay for a housing, uh, a month of, of housing because it's not a managed Medi-Cal benefit. No. And yet we have people who are housed effectively in hospitals for, I've had patients who have been there for a year because we couldn't put together a discharge plan and they had no other medical needs. So cal -Aim is really a, trying to address those various things in a very creative and bold and innovative and aggressive manner. Um, so when I, that didn't really address your question about how it thinks about population health. Um, but it, it really does look at how, how can we think about Medi-Cal delivery of services in a more creative way to solve the real problems for people and not um, what we've traditionally been allowed to pay for? Yeah, so a lot more flexibility, a lot more tools in the toolkit. Uh, cliche, but it's true, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Cool. So one thing that um, stood out to me, uh, audience, I have not known Rebecca Long, but um, I attended a population health advisory group meeting. And one thing that stood out to, to me was your passion of establishing trust with mm -hmm. certain communities or populations that may not historically uh, have believed in the healthcare system or had access or even know how to navigate it. So mm -hmm. where... What drove that passion for you? Where does that come from? It comes from a lot of places. I think um, just from my description of where I come from in case management and some of the work that I've done from there is where it started, realizing in hospital-based case management, I was so frustrated because I never felt like we could solve a problem. We would just kick the problem kick the can down the road and say somebody else needs to address these underlying conditions. And there was nobody whose job it was to do that. Um, then, then we had COVID and then we had the George Floyd murder and we've had a number of other events where suddenly the entire healthcare community across the U.S. and world has said, there's so many deep inequities in our system. There's this structural racism and there's, um, there's just obvious disparities by race, immigration strat, uh, status, the infrastructure of where people are born and grow up, that, that this has to change. Every health plan in California that contracts with the HCS is required to do an annual population needs assessment. That's also an NCQA requirement. Okay. But that PNA, population needs assessment, is how we go and look at our overall population and say, what's especially of concern to our population? For example, urban crime, while a huge issue for, say, LA or Oakland, is not an issue for our area. Um, yeah. It doesn't have that much impact on northern rural California, but what does are wildfires. Yeah. Oh my goodness, they they wreak havoc on people's breathing, their housing, um, so many other things like that. So the PNA is one of the ways we go through when we take all this information that's um, it's based on our, our demographic data and our community information through county places, um, county health rankings and healthy places and a lot of different ways at looking at what's going on with our population. And we have started noticing, oh my goodness, our Native American tribes, they're not a huge portion of our population, but they are hugely underserved. Yeah. And why could that be? And then we've been looking at, you know, the the 
information that's coming out in the news as far as, wow, there's been so much historical abuse. And, you know, we've heard about the the cemeteries at Native boarding schools. We've heard about missing uh, tribal women. We've heard about forced sterilizations. And our government has done those things. And yeah. so now, as a government agency, when we say trust us, we just want to fix, you know, have you come in for a well child visit, there's understandable mistrust. Oh, and yeah. so yeah. we have to, we can't, we can't improve their health without demonstrating that we're trustworthy. It's a, it's a first line. Yeah, no, well said and good call out on the, on the wildfires. Uh, I'm based in Southern California, and even down here, we're st- we're experiencing a little bit of that. Not not at the same level as Northern California. Actually, before the show, um, um, I uh, I was looking at a, a message from Edison. You guys have uh, PG&E as the bigger yeah. mm-hmm. provider up there, but even Edison, like one of the things they showed today in a recent mailer was uh, their their wildfire changes. So what you're saying is definitely top of mind for me. So with the building trust, you know, are you able to give an example of maybe? a win that either you have seen or that you see coming down the pipeline? Yeah, there's a, there's a few ways that we're trying to build trust. One of the things we did um, a couple years ago is we nominated uh, one of our county's tribal health home, tribal health home visiting programs for moms as a true innovator in how they engage um, pregnant and new moms into well child care. Um, so recognizing their efforts was one thing. Um, another thing that I'm very excited about is uh, we have an annual hospital symposium. And this year, our symposium is focused on improving access for trial bill population. We have a keynote speaker who's a, a COO from a county Indian health project. And so in saying this is so important, we're going to dedicate one of our major conferences to hearing from you. Um, But it's also true that these are just the start of a long-term investment. You can't build trust overnight. Yeah, no, well said. Well, we've gone through a little bit about partnership, a little bit about you, a little bit about uh, population health. Is there anything else um, that you think our audience should be aware of with any of these uh, any of these items, Rebecca? I think it's an evolving area. Um, Population health and health equity have become um, intermingled terms. And I, I feel like this is the, the, um, they call it the bleeding edge of healthcare. It's where there's so much innovation and opportunity. And I'm really excited to see how this can move forward. And I'm also really passionate about not losing this opportunity. There's a lot of goodwill in the community right now. And it would be a shame to squander these resources, this energy, and um, what this opportunity could do in transformation. Well, you're in the right position to make sure, hopefully, that it's not uh, a squandered. And I love the passion. Uh, it's definitely shining. It shined at the other meeting, which is why I reached out to you to, to have you on the show. And folks, Rebecca, um, uh, shame on me. I, I gave her kind of short notice to be a guest in a short window of time. And uh, she and her team were so kind to work together to make this episode come together. So folks, uh, or Rebecca, I should ask, um, if folks want to keep tabs on on what work you're doing, you mentioned uh, LinkedIn earlier, are you somewhat active? Is that a good place for folks to connect with you and follow you? I'm not very active on LinkedIn, but Partnership is active on social media and we have a lot of posts on social uh, Facebook and other sites. So if you wanna follow Partnership Health Plan of California, that's where you'll see us. All right. Sounds good. And again, partnership is in 14 counties today in Northern California, uh, rural counties for the most part, and possibly up to 24 come 2024. That's an interesting, uh, interesting coincidence. Synergy. Yep. Yeah. Well, again, really appreciate you uh, turning this around so quickly. Um, you've been very flexible and, and a very gracious guest. So thank you so much, Rebecca, for joining today. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to another episode of Pop Health Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode. And if you have and want to check out other episodes, visit us at pophealthpodcast.com, iTunes or Apple Music, Spotify, Stitcher, and now YouTube as well. Take care.